Good morning, uh, good afternoon, uh, good evening from wherever you're dialing uh, in. It's Filippo Veglio with the WBCSP team. Very warm uh, welcome uh, to all of you. Uh, thank you very much for joining us for this virtual event, uh, part of a wider series of WBCSD around the business and sustainability uh, agenda, as you know. And you, of course, know the circumstances for the virtual event series, of course, the, the dramatic uh, situation around health uh, and safety uh, around the world through uh, COVID. We've kicked off uh, these discussions, these online meetings in the months of April and the uh, series lasts all the way through uh, July and most likely beyond uh, that. Uh, on behalf of the WBCSD team, uh, a very warm welcome in particular, of course, for this session today and looking at the future of work. And as you see the title here, uh, shaping the future, future of work by uh, putting uh, people uh, first. I have the pleasure of being your host uh, today alongside uh, my colleague, uh, David Fiedler, the manager uh, for social impact at WBCSD and myself in the position of managing director for the people program and the outreach functions in WBCSD. And David, if we can go to the next slide, please. Um, delighted to be your host today and leading you uh, through this uh, call. And delighted alongside uh, Davide uh, to uh, welcome uh, today's uh, speakers. In fact, we have uh, six uh, speakers with us today, all of them on the line and we have tested the connections. Everything should work out fine. Uh, in the order left to right, uh, Sonia van uh, Lishout representing uh, Randstad, uh, Jessica Hyde representing uh, Accenture, uh, Santander represented by Cristina Soto Rubio, uh, Sonai uh, represented by uh, Mafalda Lobo Xavier, uh, Mel Melis uh, dialing in from the UK representing uh, Fujitsu, and last but certainly not least for CP Group uh, Viranon Futrakul. A very warm welcome and, and thanks to you on behalf of the team for agreeing to share uh, your perspectives uh, today. Uh, of course, uh, today is also a wider meeting in terms of having opened it up um, beyond the closed door meetings that we usually hold. It is also a public meeting. So allow me just a couple of slides to introduce the World Business Council for Sustainable Development, WBCSD, that uh, acronym impossible to spell out. WBCSD in a nutshell, um, a group an alliance of companies, uh, 200 global companies united around this common vision that you see outlined here. Uh, nine plus billion people living well within the boundaries of the planet by the middle of the century. The idea of business leadership and the idea of connecting uh, business uh, sustainability and business uh, success, business resilience, uh, management of risks, capturing of opportunities, uh, disclosures in line with trends, and the integration of the sustainability agenda into business a strategy and a decision making very much at the core of WBCSD. Uh, WBCSD, uh, and I want to in particular to thank our uh, member company representatives for being on the line today. As we can see on the next slide, we've got uh, 200 uh, logos laid out here. A very warm welcome to you, uh, representing uh, over 20 industry sectors and uh, if we take the headquarter of each respective company, uh, 40 plus uh, countries represented in uh, the councils. A very warm welcome to all of you from wherever you are dialing in uh, across the world. We appreciate your support, uh, even more so in these particularly difficult times um, of uh, COVID-19. Um, WBTSD in a nutshell, and this is the only institutional slide that I'll show you on the next slide, the institution focuses on six um, system transformation or six program uh, areas, uh, the areas of circularity, uh, the area of uh, urban uh, infrastructure, uh, climate and energy, the nature of the food agenda, uh, the people agenda, where the future of work is, of course, uh, strongly uh, embedded with Davide and my colleague Natalie leading uh, the work. And last but not least, the uh, uh, agenda that we call redefining value looking at measurement, uh, disclosure, measurement, valuation and disclosures of companies in line with the principles of uh, sustainable uh, capitalism. So a wide uh, ranging uh, agenda and today's focus future work strongly embedded in the people uh, agenda. And you will hear of course, a lot more details about that in the, in the minutes uh, to come. Uh, today's agenda, uh, very briefly to walk you through what's coming up in the next uh, 80 or so uh, minutes. 
Uh, that if we can go to the next uh, slide, uh, please. <coughs> Today's agenda is basically laid out in the five pillars uh, here, a short setting the scene from my end and also allowing, of course, everybody to uh, connect uh, via Zoom as we uh, get there. We are about 40 now and uh, several more expected in the next few minutes. Um, we will then go into a, a keynote by our colleague from uh, Randstad, Sonia, uh, who will provide some perspectives on COVID-19 and the future of work and some interesting developments there uh, that she wants to uh, share. We'll then go into the third section uh, that we headed, as you can see here, putting people at the heart of the future of work. So for about a half an hour, we'll look at uh, perspectives from Accenture, Sonai and uh, Santander around solutions in terms of enabling a, a better future uh, of work. What are they tangibly doing within their own four walls and value chains? And then we will have uh, Fujitsu and CP Group uh, sharing uh, the business principles for people-centered technology transformation. It's something that we are launching uh, today. In fact, we have a short launch article yesterday and today formally launching it uh, publicly. So they will provide a little bit of insight into the principles, but also into how they're being applied uh, in the case of CP Group. And then we'll hopefully have a short wrap up uh, just to finish in time, uh, 80 or so minutes from uh, now. Allow me before we really get started, also a little bit of housekeeping, the usual uh, WBCSD slides, there's two of them. The first one is to indicate to you that the session is being recorded in order to be able to share it with people who couldn't uh, make it to the session. Um, I would uh, like to encourage you to please remain uh, muted so you are, as participants, uh, muted. Uh, but of course, we are making all of the information available also in the, in the standard way that we have been doing for the past two months. The information of the meeting is I think we just lost Filippo. Uh, let me just double check on him. Uh, in the meantime, I just take over while he comes back from the freeze. Uh, let me just make sure. So we're in the housekeeping here. So uh, I think Filippo was saying uh, the recording and the slides will be shared after the meeting um, for both of the sessions today. During the meeting, please use the chat function if you have any questions. Um, ideally, send them to, if you want to send them privately, send them to me or to the speakers. Um, we will make sure that, uh, that the question gets played back um, into the room. Um, you can also raise your hand um, later on uh, or provide some, uh, some uh, uh, feedback through uh, thumbs up, thumbs down, clapping. Um, Filippo, are you back? I'm back. I don't know what happened. It's the first time in uh, three months that Zoom literally dies on me, but um, I'm back. Here we go. I just, that, um, I just saw, talked about the chat function. You can take over again. No, thank you. I just literally looked at the, at the black screen, so I don't know what happened. Anyway, let's move on. Uh, let's move also a little bit to the rules of WBCSD, rules of engagement around the conversation topics. And I'm sharing this out of the principles of governance of WBCSD throughout the executive committee. Please refrain in the context of antitrust uh, to engage in any discussion around uh, competitively sensitive uh, topics such as the ones that you see outlined here, that is pricing and costs, strategies around bids, uh, capacity additions or reductions in the future, uh, customer issues or output decisions. We appreciate your understanding so that we always follow the guidelines of WBCSD with regard to uh, the um, antitrust uh, regulations. A very, very short setting the scene from my end uh, before handing over to our colleague Sonia from Randstad. Um, just setting the scene a little bit about future of work and the World Business Council of how we are uh, framing it. Uh, on the next slide, you see an outline of who is engaged in this particular uh, topic. Uh, we have had uh, for about 18 months now this project running. Uh, we have got 23 member uh, companies and over a handful of our local um, partners uh, engaged in shaping. Uh, activities in shaping um, discussions, in shaping uh, tools, in shaping outputs. And today is uh, with the launch of the principles, one of these examples of the, of the outputs. So I want to strongly and warmly uh, thank uh, all of the representatives of both the member companies and the partners who are on the line with us uh, today from across the world 
for their support and for their ongoing trust in the work and the, collabor the collaborative nature of this work uh, that carries on. The collaborative nature, uh, next slide, David, that, it, that is shaped by a joint uh, vision for the future of work that you see outlined here in, uh, in, in pink, in orange, uh, people work to thrive uh, personally, professionally, and as active uh, members uh, of society, driven by the idea of uh, security, of well-being, of empowerment, and uh, purpose as strong pillars uh, underpinning uh, this uh, vision and driven by the idea of shaping the future of the workforce, of businesses, of labor markets, and social support uh, mechanisms. This is not meant to be a long introduction to future work as into, in terms of how it is being uh, designed and shaped in WBCSD, but you can find a lot more information and documentation online, but very much want to underline that this vision is also backed uh, by leadership, a leadership statement, um, um, endorsed uh, by the executives that you see outlined uh, here, uh, 13 of them, uh, five of whom are part of our executive uh, committee and uh, backing the idea of a vision and of an ambition, uh, ambitious vision on the future of work uh, around the idea of business action and business collaboration, collaboration among businesses, but also collaboration with other uh, key institutions in the public uh, sector in particular, of course. So clearly the idea of putting people at the center of the future of work and people-centered solutions is something that will strongly come back as throughout the call, uh, I am sure. So with that said, let us go into the first online uh, test and make it hopefully a little bit interactive uh, and, and uh, not hear me uh, anymore all of the time uh, and handing over very soon to the speakers. But we had just a, a first question for you. If I could kindly ask you, to those who, are, who have the means to go online right now, and multitask to go online to menti.com and use the code 322785 and answer the question that you see um, laid out here on this particular uh, slide. So what has been the biggest challenge for your workforce as a result of uh, COVID-19 is the question. And uh, if you dial in to that particular uh, site with that particular uh, code, you will have a number of uh, options uh, to reply. We would be interested in hearing from you over the next couple of minutes or so to give you the time. And here we see some of the results uh, popping up. Thank you to those who uh, are dialing uh, into that um, poll. Let's give it a minute or so. David, I rely on you to tell me how long we should give this to um, come to life. Interesting, the mental health aspect, which is very prominent uh, in this COVID-19 uh, context, adaptability. Work-life balance, collaboration, how to do it also remotely. Something that is challenging a lot of organizations, how to adapt and, and keep the collaborative spirit uh, going. Interesting word cloud. We'll make sure to keep consolidating those results. David, I don't know if you have a specific comment on basically what's coming in. Uh, no, no specific comment. I see many of the things we uh, will be discussing today or exactly. this afternoon. Uh, very interesting to see, as you said, mental health, work-life balance, yeah. adaptability. So um, many of the things we, we saw, uh, we wanted to discuss and many of the things, and some actually things we may not be addressing today, but we have been addressing in our work, in our group, uh, and we'll be looking at later as well. Um, I Excellent. think we have about 41 inputs out of 50, so I think we can... Uh, oh, right. So uh, I think I see, uh, well, there's only like a few left, which is probably us. So I can, yeah, Filippo, we can actually now <laughs> hand over to Randstad. Okay, we will keep oh, yeah. this work cloud going, and we have a session, I should have said, this is the first session for today. We'll repeat this session uh, in some cases with slightly different speakers because of the time uh, zone differences, uh, but we will continue uh, monitoring that work cloud and share, of course, the final version of topics that come up and, and share it then with you uh, post a session. So without much uh, ado, I basically want to transition to the uh, second part, which is our keynote address, which is uh, from one of our, of our uh, 
uh, member shaping the future of work uh, project in WBCST, leading that part uh, of the project, uh, Randstad. Uh, we're delighted to have Sonia van Lieshout on the line and delighted for her to share as an initiative interesting by Randstad, uh, the ADECO group and Manpower group around safely back to work in the new normal, as it's called on your slide, Sonia. So I'm handing over to you, Sonia. I hope the tech works fine and looking forward to your uh, perspectives over the next 20 minutes or so. Uh, can everybody hear me? If anybody can yeah. say yes, then I know that I can uh, kick off. Uh, yeah. Thank you, <laughs> Filippo, and I see David as well. Um, so yeah, safely back to work in the new normal. I mean, the new normal has um, caught up on us, basically. Reality has caught up on us by the COVID-19 situation. And how do we return back to work in a safe and healthy modus? It's one of the issues that we have been struggling with uh, as a company, as an industry as well, like everybody has, of course. And then McKinsey wrote an article uh, McKinsey in the Netherlands, I have to, uh, to specify. McKinsey um, in the Netherlands wrote an article on safeguarding our lives and our livelihoods. And based upon that article, uh, McKinsey contacted our CEO, Jacques van der Broek, and said, you know, you are in the midst of everything. You are in the midst of all the industries, all the sectors, serving both talents, serving both uh, organizations and companies. So you must have a vision on how we can all get back to work in a safe and healthy modus. And um, our CEO said, yes, of course we have, but we cannot do this alone. If we want to kick this project off, we need the buy-in and the support of our uh, competitors, the ADECO Group and Manpower Group. And so Shep connected with the CEOs of the ADECO Group and Manpower Group, and all of a sudden we had a project called Safely Back to Work in the New Normal. It started off, um, David, can you move over to the next? Yeah, thank you. So it started off by, uh, by a launch mid-April with an open letter from the three CEOs and a positioning paper on how we could enable workers to return uh, to work in a safe and healthy modus. And we all know, of course, that the starting point was the fact that the COVID-19 situation rapidly changed the entire labor market, rapidly changed the working place all of a sudden we were faced with all these containment uh, measures and restrictions. Um, we were being forced to work from home. We were being forced to work in a digital mode from one day to another. And it also made us realize that this whole COVID-19 uh, virus is going to stay with us for a certain amount of time. It's not going to be away tomorrow or even the day after tomorrow. So how do we adapt to what will be what we would like to call the new normal? Um, I think that's the most important question that we will be um, uh, discussing today as well. And of course, physical distancing is, is one thing, um, but it's also um, hampering our way back into the work lives uh, that we were used to, you know, catching up with, at, uh, with a coffee, uh, with your colleagues on the workplace, that totally looks different right now than a couple of months ago. Um, David, if you can move over to the next slide. <clears throat> what we have seen is already this. And one is that uh, we need to safeguard our lives, which we have been doing basically in the pandemic phase. Um, we need to contain the virus, we need to uh, find a, a cure, we need to find a treatment, we need to um, increase our testing capacities. Um, but another thing is, of course, safeguarding our livelihoods as well. And basically, around those two axes, um, our governments have been trying to balance and trying to fight this whole COVID-19 situation. So safeguarding our livelihoods means supporting people and business by, you know, who are affected by the lockdown measures. David, if you can move over to the next slide. Wonderful. So we have seen that McKinsey has drafted all these uh, scenarios um, that will definitely have an economic impact on our uh, lives and livelihoods. Um, what we have basically been seeing is that we have been falling off a cliff uh, during the pandemic phase. Okay, well, all the scenarios you see are falling off a cliff uh, for sure. But what we had hoped is that we would, you know, um, 
starting up in, in a V-shape or even in a U-shape, getting back to our new reality, getting back to what used to be the old normal in a very quick uh, way. And this doesn't seem likely. What seems more likely is the scenario A1, falling off a cliff and climbing up a stairs again. Meaning that it will take some time to get to post-COVID-19 crisis situation in terms of um, lives and livelihoods um, and getting back to that modus will take some time. So if you can move over to the next slide, David. We have already seen that uh, the labor markets have been impacted by the COVID-19 situation. And there's a bit of a difference between the US and Europe. In Europe, we have seen that, uh, that many people have already been made redundant or became unemployed. And especially the low paid jobs in the US are being hit hard at this moment in time. Well, if we compare it to Europe, which is on the next slide, David, Yes, we can see that 50% of all jobs at risk in Europe fall into the customer service, sales, food service, and the construction sector. But we also have seen that in Europe, unlikely, um, or in, in comparison with, with, in, with the US, we have seen that in Europe, many of the workers have been put on a furlough scheme, on working, short working time schemes, uh, with the financial support of governments, so there's a big difference between Europe and the US. In the US, you, see, you already see the unemployment figures uh, increasing tremendously. And even in Europe, you see now that we are moving from the pandemic phase into the uh, recovery phase. You see that the unemployment figures are increasing um, yeah, week by week, I would almost say. And it's especially if, if um, David, if you can move over to the next slide, please. It's especially the young people in uh, between the age of 15 and 24 that are being hit hard. It's especially the ones that are trying to balance between their study life and their work life that are uh, being forced out of the labor market at this moment in time. And we said as an industry, you know, we are uniquely positioned um, to help all those groups. If we can move over to the next slide, David. We have already in uh, 2018 on a global level put 58 million people in jobs um, across, a, you know, across various sectors, I would say. And knowing that 74% of the agency work, workers are still in employment, um, 12 months after their initial assignment, that means a huge thing in this specific economic crisis. So we said to, uh, with the three companies together, we are uniquely positioned to help here. We have those connections with uh, all the stakeholders. And all, by all the stakeholders, we mean, of course, governments, NGOs, but also the sector and industry associations. We have the connections with the talents. We have the connections with the central employer organizations. So how can we, in a surfing kind of way, put our offer on the table to help both companies, as well as organizations, as well as governments, as well as talents, um, yeah, to, to use our expertise uh, in order to get back to the new normal in a safe and healthy modus. And David, if we can move again to the next slide. What may be good for you to realize is that the health and safety protocols have always been, since the very start of our organizations, been uh, part of our business. So we have always been taking care of health and safety protocols to ensure that our agency workers, our flex workers, can get to work in a health, healthy and safe uh, mode. And we, we took a look at the, these health and safety protocols and we said to ourselves, you know, there's only minor adjustments needed in order to make them COVID-19 proof. So based upon that expertise, based upon those intelligence, we said, how can we connect with the central employer organizations, with the government to, um, for them to benefit from, from our expertise and intelligence and to ensure that everybody gets access to these health and safety protocols. And if we then move over to the next slide, David. Yeah, and I think we can even skip this one already. We have already uh, said, you know, we have a lot of examples available for everybody uh, up on request 
um, that they can use in order to test if their health and safety protocols, whether that is on a company level or even on a sector or industry level, to test if their health and safety protocols are COVID-19 proof and if they are up to the standards that we need in order to get back to, the, to what will be the new normal. And even in the Netherlands, David, if we can move over to the next slide, we are in contact with the Minister of Economy, as we are in Italy as well, uh, where we are in an um, advising committee on advising the Minister of Economic Affairs um, on how and what these health and safety protocols should look like. So in the Netherlands, there have been uh, 50 sector protocols submitted uh, to the Ministry, ministry of, of Economics to test if they are really up to the standards to what is necessary in, to get back to work in the new and um, to what will be the new normal, of course. So within these um, advisory committees, uh, all the protocols are being tested, are being approved by the Ministry of Economic Affairs. And of course, there's a lot of guidance from the Public Health Department as well. We are there only to support and advise the Minister of what a health and safety protocol should look like. And the employer organization can then, on a national level, take it up to the other sectors in order to implement and roll out on what um, should uh, a, a normal protocol look like in a way. David, if we can move over to the next slide. The idea started off to focus on five sectors only. So that would be the transport and logistics, the automotive, the manufacturing and life science, uh, sector, the construction and the food sector. Uh, why did we focus only on the, those five sectors? Because we saw that those are the five sectors that are basically crucial within the pandemic phase to continue and um, in order to support both lives and, and livelihoods and to safeguard them, of course. We also said in the very first beginning that we were going to focus on 10 countries. Now we have already, and this is already an outdated um, a presentation in that sense. We have already uh, increased the level up to 25 countries across the globe so far. So we are now in uh, Canada, we are now implemented in the US, in Japan, uh, even in China for that matter, Australia, India, um, New Zealand, but also in a lot of countries within Europe and I think most of them are already on the list. So if you are hesitant uh, about one country, just let me know and I will, ex I will let you know if we are there as well. But in a time frame of less than seven weeks, we have started in 10 countries and scaled up to 25 countries. Um, so that tells you something about the urgency of people wanting to yeah, not only the urgency, but also the willingness, I would say, of people wanting to get back to work, uh, even if that is in a, in a new way, um, taking into account all of the health and safety protocols, but people are really eager to get back to work, whether that is uh, from a working from home level mode or even returning to their offices where they can spend time with each other. Uh, David, if you can move over to the next slide, please. So we are really calling on other stakeholders to join our initiative. Everybody can join it. Just let us know if you would be interested to join. And um, we also have some tools available. We have the position paper. We have the open letter. We have a booklet with all of the protocol examples. And we even have, if what you can say is a test your protocol scan selfie. So we via our website, both from um, Randstad, Diadeco Group and Manpower Group, you can test if your protocol is up to the uh, to, to the COVID-19 standards in order to return um, in a health and safety work mode. Um, David, if you can move over to the last slide. Yes. So if you are interested to join this alliance, please let us know. The contacts are uh, on the screen. If you have any questions whatsoever, let us know via the chat box or even contact um, us afterwards. No problem at all. I think David and Filippo, the, uh, the presentation will be shared afterwards. Absolutely. So in that sense, everybody can have a look at it again and you know, decide for themselves, um, do we want to be part of this or not? So 
thank you so much for the time and looking forward to any questions so far. Thank you, Sonia. Uh, fantastic and uh, there I say unprecedented collaboration in the HR service industry and, and certainly uh, something very comprehensive and, and very thought through around this return to, to work and, and thank you for having been very transparent about it and also of course for being able then to share the information after the call. Um, I took the liberty of putting up a short uh, chat note saying if you have any questions don't hesitate to ask to Sonia via the chat but I don't see anything uh, coming through yet unless there's somebody uh, who volunteers uh, for a question uh, right away uh, by freeing up their microphone. Otherwise, we have a question for all of you in the next slide, but let's maybe give it a few seconds to see if anybody would like to come forward. Sonia? Yeah, Felipe, maybe just one thing to add as a final information. Yeah. Um, at the very start of this project, we were supported by McKinsey. Um, they did it pro bono, so it was all cost-free in that sense, which is also a very good um, um, initiative from both McKinsey as well as the three corporate companies. Now that we are in the next phase of the Alliance uh, project, we are going to hand over to our industry federation, which is the World Employment Confederation, and they will look after the next phases to come. So basically we split up uh, the project into a couple of phases. Phase one is about connecting um, and, and aligning with all of the stakeholders. And then the next phase to come is, okay, how can we get out of this um, recovery phase, start uh, building the eco economic situation and really be part of that solution so that we can play that role in the labor market. Thank you, Sonia. Good to know. Uh, look, there are three questions that came through. I'm just going to pass one on to you uh, from uh, Jan. Uh, how could we access the protocols and tools that were developed for specific sectors, Sonia? Do you have uh, the answer? Yeah, you can go to our website and um, you can already a look on the website and I will make sure to incorporate uh, or to at least include the, the link to Filippo and David to okay. share with you afterwards. Perfect. But on the website are all the information where you can access the protocols and tools developed for specific, uh, specific um, uh, sector initiatives. Perfect. And then, uh, thank you. And then we have uh, Kate uh, who asks about the loss of jobs in the food industry. Uh, Sonia, if you could explain a little bit further. It must yeah. have been on slide, on one of the early slides. Yeah, I know. What we have seen so far is that, um, and we have seen that already in, in many sectors, I would say, is that there are some, some jobs, you know, COVID-19 has basically acted as some sort of a pressure cooker, as I might yeah. say so. So we have seen that future jobs that were in the future on stake being um, you know, made redundant, have already been made redundant uh, due to the COVID-19 situation. And it's basically um, technicians, it's about wellness, uh, those kind of jobs that have been made uh, redundant and um, that are being retrained and reskilled to be placed into another position within either the food services or within another sector. But those specific types of um, positions have been made redundant within this COVID-19 situation. So, yeah, really as a result of the pressure cooking effect of the COVID-19 situation. Thank you, Sonia. And um, a warm hello to our colleague Andrew Peterson, the CEO of uh, BCSD Australia, who says that the work um, has been fed into Safe Work Australia, the nationally consistent work health and safety guidance on COVID-19. And then thank you, uh, Andrew, for the link that you passed on. Thank you and thank you for being with us all the way from Australia uh, tonight for you basically. <laughs> so um, Sonia, no other questions for the moment. Uh, let us then go and thank you again. Let us continue the conversation. If anything comes up, uh, we will direct it back to you. But there is another Mentimeter uh, poll. Is that the right way of using the language? Mentimeter poll around uh, what your thoughts are on the biggest opportunity for your workforce as a result of uh, COVID-19 uh, and a number of options that will go through uh, on the website of menti.com once you go into it. So let's give it a few minutes and then I'll hand over to Davide for the analysis of this and then taking it over for a discussion with our colleagues from uh, Santander, Sonaya and Accenture. 
Thank you, Filippo. Yes, so basically, really, we're looking at, uh, we looked at the challenges before, but maybe some people have already seen some opportunities here. Uh, I see the working from home, which I think was one of the first ones that uh, was discussed when, when COVID-19 uh, started having an impact and the lockdowns started to happen, um, that we realized, many people realized, many businesses realized that uh, working from home um, had similar or better, sometimes even uh, levels of productivity than in the office. Uh, comes with other challenges, but here definitely interesting to see how uh, how we learn. Let's say, and as, as Sonia was saying, the pressure cooking. Uh, really, we we're, we're learning uh, actually hands on uh, what the future work uh, that we were before talking about may actually look like. So uh, interesting to see that we see flexibility work independently, uh, more agile and flexible working environments. Um, so definitely here, uh, some of the things that we have been seeing. Um, I'm scrolling down, a lot of working remotely, which is uh, clear. Becoming more resilient, I think, is something that uh, a lot of our response programs are talking about, right, Filippo? Um, the WCSD COVID-19 response programs, Absolutely. which we will also uh, present at the end of the, of the uh, webinar. Um, Work-life balance, I've seen that coming up a lot of times. Um, really now the, the line before was already blurry, uh, being available on, on the phone or on the pad or with internet being always available to respond to emails. Now even more when the physical space of the office and, and home get uh, blurred even more. That of course is in the context of, uh, of uh, office work mainly, um, but uh, would be interesting to see more of that and how to deal with it. And we actually have some of these discussions um, in this webinar and the one this afternoon. Um, not being restrained to location anymore. Yes, also one of the future work trends that we had seen before, uh, but now definitely again accelerated and sped up by the, by the COVID-19 uh, pandemic and lockdowns. Um, efficiency due to safe time as traveling is reduced. So really a few topics here that we, um, that we were already discussing somehow in the future work in general, but again, um, we have seen an acceleration happening during to COVID-19. Um, upskilling employees towards digital transformation. Thank you for that. Uh, that is something that we definitely will be uh, looking at in this webinar uh, today um, as we talk about also the tech transformation and how to uh, address it in a responsible and transformative way. I, this is going to be open. I think uh, we're good on time. I, I'll leave it open uh, while we continue uh, in the, um, with our meeting. So uh, you may not see what's happening, but um, the poll, let's say, is still open if you still want to uh, provide some input to that. Um, and I would just change then. Um, so we would get now to the next slot uh, and part of the of the meeting today um, and I would like to share with you we would like to share with you some solutions from member companies that sometimes are but not all of them are related to COVID-19 so really we're going here into this, the space of the future of work in general and how we uh, as a project as project members uh, want and are putting people at the heart of the future of work um, this is building basically uh, from the, the work that it, we have been doing over the last uh, two years or so already, um, where we realized that many people are talking about preparing for the future work, um, but we didn't see much in terms of the role of business in, in the future work, the role that business should play to create a better future work. So we thought, how about we actually go and talk to our members, we invite our members to share some of their experiences, some of their solutions, some of the ways that they are uh, leading, that they're uh, leading uh, and implementing to really change how work uh, is done, how work is carried out, and how we maybe can design work better uh, and really doing that in a people-centric way. We then, um, especially last year, and we continue doing so, we uh, collected case studies from our members. We currently have 19 uh, very short case studies and seven deep dives of a few pages to really look at the challenges and the benefits and business case that you can read. Um, and those really are examples from um, WPCD member companies that 
we hope can inspire your strategies and your action. And if you do have any examples that you would like to share with us, feel free to contact us. Um, and then we can, we can look at um, sharing your uh, solutions, your strategies when it comes to future work challenges uh, with the membership and, and with the uh, general public. You can find all of these on the Future Work Hub, uh, futurework.wcsd.org slash action is the page where you will find all of these case studies. Um, they are online and they also you can also be, download them in a little uh, booklet that we prepared. And three of the companies, uh, some of the companies that we'll be speaking today are already in the booklet with, with some of the examples. Some will be coming uh, and will be included in this soon. So with that, I would like to hand over to Jessica uh, Hyde from Accenture. She's the uh, Global Corporate Citizenship uh, Strategy Lead at Accenture. Um, and Jessica will talk to us about um, an inclusive, the Inclusive Future of Work initiative that they have been running. Um, and we will hear what this is about, um, what type of inclusion they're focusing on, and how COVID has had an impact on this initiative and maybe has reshaped the thinking or their approach to this, uh, to this work. Jessica, um, yeah. Thank you, Davide. Thank you. Thank you. Um, and hello, everybody. Um, fascinating um, insights so far from the previous speaker, so thank you for that. Um, so as Davide said, I mean, my focus is very much on how do we help wider society as part of our corporate citizenship efforts and very much focused um, traditionally in the skilling space. Um, and a lot of our work had been looking at how we help people to get into work in the first instance or to build their own businesses. Um, and if we just um, skip on to the first slide, thank you, Debbie. Um, about 18 months ago, um, we looked at how could we also su support experienced workers, so those individuals who were already in the workplace um, and were likely to be at risk of or already starting to be displaced by some of the technolo technological changes that um, were going on. And so the piece of work that um, we published um, a year and a half ago was very much you know, based on um, global research, ethnographic interviews, looking at where we expected some of the key changes to be, but then also looking at making this a positive piece around what can we do about it and what are the kind of action places that we can look to engage in. Um, so just to kind of be clear on who we were particularly focused on, we were focused on those individuals who were either at risk at of or already being displaced by intelligent technologies or emerging technologies, um, those who had less than degree level qualifications, had lower financial security, um, lower job security and less access to on-the-job training and we found that those individuals were also more likely to be in the roles that were most likely to be um, automated first so essentially the people who had less support um, and less ability to weather the change were those who were also most likely to be impacted so we talk about double disadvantage in that space and really trying to focus on helping those beneficiaries who are facing that double disadvantage um, and that could include those who are employed or also entrepreneurs or um, working in the gig economy. Um, and so as part of that research, we talked about the four solution spaces that you can see in the, the centre of the slide here. So this was around saying that um, if we are to help individuals who have already been in the workplace to navigate um, career changes, then we need, of course, to think about skilling and that's the expand space, but there are these other places that we also need to ensure we're focused on. So we need to start with Envision and Envision is very much around helping people to build the confidence um, that they need to consider new career paths. So understanding, you know, what position they're coming from, their innate strengths that they might bring with them, their existing skill set, what, what is transferable within that and helping them to understand that they can redefine themselves in terms of the occupation that they might have been in. So if you think about an example of somebody who might have worked in um, a more routine role in a um, contact centre, um, if, for example, technology is to set to displace um, or, or, in fact, um, take on the majority of that person's role, if they've defined themselves in that particular role for a period of time, how do you help them to understand that they can redefine themselves and they can bring all of those strengths and, and skills to a new role? So the envisioning essentially is the kind of psychological change that's required up front. Then there's the expand piece, which is around actually building the skills required to then close the gap to move into new roles. Experiences um, around how you might be able to use, for example, VR, XR or apprenticeships or other ways to test out potential new careers um, prior to moving into one and then um, empower is around bringing people together to share their experiences. So what worked, what didn't work, um, where are there opportunities to share from one another um, around um, yeah, lessons learned and, and ways to provide opportunities to other people. 
so feeding back into the group when people have been through those uh, um, those transitions. Um, so really, the, the, this was all around trying to shift the conversation around the negative press around the um, the fact that jobs were going to start disappearing. We were trying to make this a positive call to action to say, what can we do about this? How can we engage more members of the ecosystem to engage with us? We had um, a strong existing network of NGO partners and governments that we were working with, but how can we expand that even further to reach these people who need support? Um, in advance, um, hopefully of them being displaced, so looking at those who are at risk, um, and then also placing innovation at the, at the heart. So we launched um, an innovation launch pad that allowed um, ideas popping up from across the globe from our networks to um, come into a rapid proto prototyping process. And, and that was great because that has now resulted in certain solutions that we've taken forward and now available for our beneficiaries to use. So um, moving on to the next slide. Um, there have been many um, projects that have um, come to fruition across the globe and I thought I'd just talk briefly about these three because they, they demonstrate different aspects of um, solutions and projects that, that have come up. Um, so the first one in the US, uh, um, one of the projects is very much focused on local activation. So this is using um, analytics, um, local interviews and surveys to understand what is going on within a particular region, what jobs are being most impacted, which jobs are most likely to emerge, and, um, and then bringing together, convening groups of individuals from across the different types of um, partners you can see across the bottom of the screen um, to come to events, talk about the, the particular issue, talk about the local lens there, and then as a result of those sessions, create pilot projects. Um, in the UK, one of the key um, flagship projects has been um, with a partner called um, Stay Nimble. So they are a startup social enterprise. Um, we recognise that they were doing something really interesting in that envision space that I talked about. Um, so helping individuals to identify their innate strengths and talents as a first step to looking for new careers. So saying, as an individual, what are you most likely to enjoy and be successful at prior to thinking about what are the learned skills that you already have? Um, and then putting the lens of skills on top of it so, to help individuals to close the gap. So we've been working with them really closely and um, part of our support there has been um, developing responsible AI to um, create the algorithm to take this you know, scale, this solution that they'd, um, they'd identified. Um, so that's been an interesting application of responsible AI technology and ensuring that we don't um, inadvertently apply bias and recommendations that are being made. And then um, the Spanish example, Fundaula, is around um, providing training specific to emerging roles within Spain, particularly alongside um, intelligent technologies. So how can we help people to train for those um, those roles around um, supporting, but also designing those new technologies. So looking really specifically at um, those intelligent technologies and how people can work alongside and support them. Um, and this is a new B2C, um, so openly available solution that is available for people to use free of charge and is, um, been, uh, is up and running um, at the start of this year. Um, so there's just a, a few flavours of some of the solutions that kind of touch on very different solution spaces. Um, and as we kind of think about, you know, all of these things were created in advance of coronavirus, as we've been thinking about how do we adjust our programme um, in light of what's happening at the moment, um, the key change really is that when we were looking at the jobs that we thought were most likely to be impacted, um, those most human to human roles are the ones that we thought were going to be most protected. So individuals working in you know, care sectors, for example, were less likely, of course, to be um, significantly disrupted by emerging technology. But of course, those human to human roles are, dis um, are disrupted in uh, social distancing or with social distancing measures. So we're expanding the definition of those experienced workers that we want to support um, to include those in those more human to human roles as well. And looking to see, you know, with the solutions that we already had, how can we help those individuals that are finding themselves um, suffering in the current pandemic? And um, fortuitously, the solutions that we have do work and in many instances um, for that you know, widened um, pool of people. Um, in addition to that, if we just move on to the next slide. Thank you, Debbie. Um, we've also created um, the COVID-19 ac accelerator or project accelerator, which has been around recognizing that in addition to our corporate citizenship investments or alongside our corporate citizenship investments, we've seen um, a plethora of um, ideas coming up from across our over 500,000 people across the globe for responses to the COVID-19 crisis. And we wanted to provide a way in which we could bring those together, allow those groups to um, 
benefit from the same types of support and also of course share ideas across um, across the network. So um, this is structured around a kind of respond, recover, rebuild areas. So respond is primarily around food and healthcare um, projects. Recover is more around helping partners to move into the digital space. And particularly when we think about corporate citizenship, this is in you know, our NGO partners that can benefit from some of our support there around virtual working. And then distance learning, which could be you know, equally applicable to young children, but also um, adults who are looking to skill and um, either for their first job or, or to make a career transition. Um, and then in the rebuild space, we're looking at what kind of solutions are there to help individuals um, to you know, find employment, to, to continue to build their, their small um, startup businesses and the entrepreneurship um, uh, spaces and to weather the change. So um, there's three different themes, but across all of those types of um, projects that are popping up, we're, we're essentially kind of bringing three things to, to the fore. So we're allowing those connections to be made, as I said, we're providing um, upskilling to our, our project teams in, involved in these, and that includes a lot of human-centered design and responsible design consequencing um, initiatives so that we can ensure that as new ideas are coming up, we are thinking about the extended you know, social and environmental impacts of some of those ideas. Um, and then also, you know, bringing in you know, mentors and leads who can provide um, SME advice. Um, so really, you know, this, this is um, a project or a, an initiative that we've launched um, in the last couple of months, which is really trying to bring together all of, all of the COVID-19 response activity. Um, and one example to bring this to life would be, um, we've recently partnered with an NGO in the US called New Profit. Um, and they are creating a um, cohort of, they call the expert um, frontline worker cohort, essentially a cohort of individuals within the target demographic who will provide um, support and services to um, innovation challenges such as XPRIZE and MIT Solve. So XPRIZE and MIT Solve both have innovation challenges that are being run in the future of workspace. We're working with um, New Profit to create this cohort of people who will provide that input into those innovation challenges to ensure that they are life-centered or human-centered. They are taking on board the voice of those workers who are being impacted. So that's a really exciting project that's come up recently that, that very much does have a um, COVID-19 lens. Um, I've probably run over my time, Beverly. I should probably stop. <laughs> but happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Jessica. Um, if I don't see any chat questions coming through, but uh, I was actually very intrigued by the human to human roles um, because we, in the future work discussion, we've seen a lot of people saying, well, the human to human roles, the, the roles that require that human touch um, are the ones that, you know, will maybe uh, see their job at risk or their tasks at risk later. But mm -hmm. we've actually seen through COVID that, um, that if necessary, we can actually uh, move a lot of this online, um, mm. especially we look at uh, education, uh, teachers now having to learn basically how to run lessons through Zoom. Um, maybe they don't have uh, a room full of kids uh, uh, shouting at them, but they have to manage it online now. So I think there's quite some interesting developments there and, and interesting to see how those human to human roles and those yeah. human inter human uh, or interrelational skills need to change. Uh, some of those new challenges that are yes. introduced for those those um, groups of individuals who, in some instances, you know, talk about teachers, you know, they yep. they are having to continue to operate in those environments and thinking about you know the self um, safety considerations of those. So yeah, it's a definitely a very um, interesting new space that we hadn't anticipated that we're we're needing to um, yeah redirect our efforts towards. Yeah, thank you, thank you very much. Uh, very interesting. Um, I think in the next one we're going to uh, basically uh, move over to. Uh, Cristina uh, from Santander. Uh, Cristina Sotorubio is a strategy human resources at Banco Santander. Thank you for joining us uh, from Spain, I believe. And uh, this is one of the case studies that we have in our case study collection about strategic workforce planning. Um, and you are going to talk to us about the value of strategic workforce planning for the business, but also the value it creates for people uh, and uh, how, how people uh, play a play a key role, or how thinking about people plays a key role in in that thinking. Uh, Christina, over to you. Um, I I'm giving you the remote control, but let me know if it doesn't work. I just uh, I will just um, change the slides for you.
Thank you, David. So yeah, I'm gonna talk about the strategic for planning. So in the recent years, uh, we have seen drastic changes around customer behaviors, competitive landscape, employee expectations now more with the COVID crisis. And obviously digitalization has played a, a, a crucial role and is behind all these changes. And digitalization is directly impacting the capabilities and the talent uh, needed in the, in the future workforce, right? So if we want to continue and remain competitive as international players, we have to pay attention to all this and we need to assess very proactively what the workforce we need looks like in the future in terms of volume of people, but even more important in terms of skills and the capabilities that our employees, employees need in, in this uh, in near future. So, um, David, could you please pass to the other one? Perfect, thank you. Um, so, how do we do this uh, proactive uh, assessment in, in Santander? How do we achieve this? So, our answer is strategic workforce planning. So, strategic workforce planning, uh, or SWP as we call it, is an exercise that helps us to identify our future workforce needs in a systematic and very thoughtful way. And in this way, in this exercise, we measure uh, the gaps that we'll have in terms of resources and skills. Um, and this uh, input uh, will help us to define an action plan to tackle these gaps in an organic and responsible way. Um, on this basis, uh, we can ensure that we have all the required capabilities in place in, organi in our organization to deliver our strategy and the digital transformation, which is a core part of Santander long-term strategy. Um, so far, we have uh, deployed the strategy workforce planning in different uh, countries across Santander Group. Uh, as you know, uh, probably uh, Santander has a very uh, diversified, uh, it's very diversified in terms of geography. So uh, the common findings we, we have uh, across the group, as you can imagine, uh, the highest gap is expected in, in digital uh, roles, in digital positions, uh, concretely in, da in data and tech specialist roles. Um, we identify as well very high uh, re-upskilling needs, which is impacting around 65% of our current workforce in order to adapt to new digital business environment. And the third finding, the third common finding was like attrition must be managed very carefully and smartly um, to facilitate those, those reskilling needs and obviously to retain the, the critical talent. The results, if, if we look at a different country level, the results are quite different because as you can imagine, uh, geographers are living different cycles, economic cycles um, they are different in terms of digital maturity so in UK obviously the, um, the need for digital talent is higher than other countries in Latin for example in terms of attrition the picture is very different and very opposite like Mexico in Poland in Brazil the attrition is massive but in Spain it's almost inexistent or very low so you have to take actions to promote and to to, to force a bit at healthy attrition levels. Um, uh, if we move to the next slide, David, David please. So uh, this is how, uh, it's a high level feature about how a strategy uh, workforce planning methodology looks like. So just to summarize, to do this, this exercise, uh, we carry out uh, three main steps. The first one, you have to model the workforce demand based on business growth drivers and have in a, into account some pro productivity considerations. And then you, you project your workforce demand in medium term. When I say medium term, our recommendation is to, to have an eye on three, next three years, next five years, more or less, depends on, 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 on the access that you want to carry out. But the second thing is you have to calculate or to project your attrition. For that, you will review your historical attrition, uh, your retirements as well, and internal mobility, and you project that supply also in medium term in the, in the next three, five years. And then third, you, you will have, uh, as a result of the difference between demand and uh, supply, 
will have the workforce gap. It will be like automatically calculated. And you will identify the areas that may experience a shortage in workforce um, that may need a significant um, up or reskilling in, in the coming years. When you have these exercises completed, these um, insights and conclusions, diagnostic is very useful to define an action, future action plan. And you will identify the initiatives around different target topics, such as recruiting, compensation, learning, performance, patient management, as I mentioned before, internal mobility, to assess and to mitigate those gaps and findings. So um, I think as a business leader, it's very important that we must act now since the change is not only happening, but it's accelerating. Um, in this ever-changing environment, it's impossible not to embrace the benefits of new technologies and reshape our workforce of the future. But obviously we should do it in a very responsible way. So. Um, Therefore, we may not be able to project to protect all jobs. Uh, some of them are clearly becoming redundant through through new innovations. But we must we must protect people by promoting adaptability, agility, skilling or reskilling, and as well planning in advance for a dynamic future to to accelerate our transformation. So. Uh, I think these are the, the main messages that I want to, to pass on to this audience. Um, I don't know if we have any, any question. I'm anxious about the time as well. What tooling do you use for study workforce planning? I'm anticipating the questions, David. So um, we are using like in a, an, Excel, an Excel spreadsheet, some geographies as Mexico, where the amount of, uh, of employees is massive compared to other geographies are using all their, their more advanced tool. But at global level and part of global HR, we use um, Excel. It's an Excel model where we input all the financial indicators and stuff to calculate um, a demand and then we we base all the uh, attrition data to project the supply. Um, and we are using Excel for the time being. Now we are um, start working with Workday and idly in the in months or a couple of years, the idea would be maybe to integrate this functionality within Workday. But for the moment, it's Excel. Okay, thank you, Christina. Um, if there are more questions, if you have more questions for the speaker specifically, just let us know as well. We'll, we'll be happy to put you in touch. Um, there's also some information in the case studies as I shared. Um, thank the you. Next, thank you, Christina. Thank you very much. Um, now the last one of the presentations from Business Solutions. Um, someone's clicking through my slides. Sorry, let me just go back here. Um, I would like to hand over to Mafalda. Um, Mafalda is the area manager employer brand at Sonai MC, the retail uh, unit of, uh, of, of the Sonai Group. Um, and she will share with us the FlexEra program um, that Sona has been uh, running and share with us um, what they're doing around there um, and if you can also share briefly if and how COVID has been uh, has, has had an impact on this. Um, Mafalda, over to you. Hello everyone, uh, it's a great pleasure for me to be here today presenting like Davide was saying the flexibility program we implemented last year in our company and um, I would like to start uh, by telling you that um, at Sonai, uh, we really believe uh, that people are a determining factor in our success. So uh, this is one of our values and we really live up to it. So, so we are very focused in building a, a working environment where people feel good uh, so they can grow personally and professionally. And, and we believe uh, that this is the only way we can and retain talents but also it goes beyond that uh, we really believe that happy and fulfilled people work better and of course you understand this is a very valuable asset for any company and of course the external attraction is naturally added because as you know employees are our best ambassadors but in order for people uh, to develop and, and give their best, we have to make sure that we create as a company the conditions and we give people 
the tools uh, so, we, uh, so that this uh, can happen. That's why we are very focused in, in the well-being at Sonai. And so we try to, to be aware of the trends and really get to know our people needs. It's no secret uh, to anyone that flexibility is one of the most uh, valuable attributes nowadays. Um, and studi uh, studies really prove us that it improves uh, the productivity and the quality of the workforce that we have because of all the diversity and inclusion it adds uh, to a company and of course it enhances the well-being because we know that uh, the work-life balance is one of the biggest challenges that the workforce has nowadays and that this flexibility is a good response uh, to it. Uh, one of the most interesting things, at least for us in this in this process, is that we usually have the tendency to think that flexibility is something of the youngest generation. And when we really get into it, we understand that it has the same importance for everyone, for all generations. And that makes flexibility even more important and more relevant. Looking inside, uh, this is no different to us when listening uh, to our people. We know that uh, they were also aiming for some uh, flexibility in order to improve their lives. And we, we, we think that uh, to be able to talk about uh, the well-being, we really have to know uh, in depth the experience of our employees. And this is only possible by listening uh, to them and build solutions together. This is not a thing that we can do alone uh, as a company and decide for them. It's something that we should build together in order to, 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 have, uh, to be successful. Uh, from our many surveys, qualitative and, and quantitative, it was clear uh, that there was here an opportunity for us to improve this employee experience by giving them the conditions and tools. And someone is moving my presentation uh, and by giving them the conditions uh, to manage their, their work uh, um, life balance. Let's see if I have the control. Uh, let's wait. Okay, obviously uh, some of us, I know uh, many of us may not know our company, but uh, this uh, talking about flexibility in a company like ours is very challenging uh, because we have a diversity of profiles and businesses and functions. So we have a lot of brands uh, inside Sun IMC from food retail to well-being to snack, bar, snack bars and so, and so on. And we have, we are spread all over uh, our little country uh, from north to south of Portugal. And we really have a workforce uh, very diverse. This is very rich, but also uh, uh, challenging because ensuring that there is space for everyone to feel good and valued inside here is, is really, really uh, a challenge and more when we are talking because our main business is the food retail. Uh, it's a sector that we do not associate uh, flexibility with due to the nature of the functions it uh, incorporates. But we really didn't let that stop us. Um, and it made us build solutions, let's say tailored uh, solutions uh, to the different needs. And for the work where we had the technology and the tools that could enable us to step forward, we really did it. And uh, it allowed us to implement measures uh, simply in a, in a very easy way that would strongly impact people's lives and improve their, their, personal, their professional experiences. Let's see if I, have, if I still have the control. And that is where our Exit Up program was born. Uh, it was built hand in hand with our people. Uh, it's based in a philosophy of trust where we give people all the necessary autonomy to be able to access different flexible working solutions according uh, uh, to their needs uh, so they can manage really uh, the balance between their personal and, and, and professional lives. And of course, it had uh, uh, contribute uh, very positively uh, to higher levels of satisfaction, well-being and commitment. And just to present you very briefly, it's a, a program that includes five initiatives, the remote work, uh, maybe the most uh, common one, the flexi work where we divide uh, fixed periods with mobile periods, extra days off, so unpaid um, extra days, part-time schedule, giving people that possible, that possibility, and also um, unpaid leave. Uh, I would just like to point
point out that uh, to share with you that during this process, it was very clear for us that it was not only about launching a program or a policy, it's about really transforming the culture and, and the way of working and the way we see it. So we knew it was uh, really important for us that we have to have our leadership, our manager on board with us. Uh, so we, we focused on launching, firstly, uh, this program to all the managers with training sessions and, and work, working with them very closely in order uh, for them to, be, to feel safe um, and confident on this path. And we do believe this was key uh, uh, to our success. Of course, um, we knew to, in order to do that, we needed to be agile and it was something also that we, we would like to share with you because sometimes uh, during these projects, we tend to wait for the perfect solution before acting and let's wait, it has to be perfect and, and sometimes it delays very important steps very important steps to to people so we decided and it was also difficult for us okay let's move forward forward with what we have um what was ready to use let's focus on making it simple on making it uh, very easy for everyone uh, to use because they will benefit for, from that so we build a very easy and simple platform in the sharepoint already uh, that we had uh, available and it was very intuitive it was a program that it we really felt it, it had to be transparent. So uh, the employees submit their access, the managers are notified. notified. If, they, if they decline that access, they have to justify it. So it was clear to everyone that we want this program to be transparent. It is data-based, so very useful for us to understand what is happening with our workforce, where people are benefiting more from it. And, and also it, um, we wanted it to be monitorable in order that uh, we assure the, legal, uh, the, the all the legal uh, constraints, but also that once again, managers were able um, to, to have some assurance in order to control um, their team's um, work. Um, to share with you that uh, the results were, were very good, if it allows me here to show you to the to the next slide, um, with almost uh, I'm David. Uh, okay, I'm just showing too much. Uh, with almost fifty percent of eligible uh, population using it, and really a very fond of it, and just very quickly to to share that uh, to stand out that most of these requests were uh, from women, something that we we knew we were we were. Expecting affecting it from Gen X, maybe that not, it was not that obvious, and mainly uh, non-managers. Of course, the most popular initiative was, as expected, uh, the remote work. But more important uh, than numbers, really, uh, we, we really believe that, is the impact we have in people's lives. So the stories that employees shared with us uh, confirmed us, really, that we are on the right track. and. He, that we have taking, taken a, a very important step uh, from people who managed to, to be more present in their children's and families' lives uh, to others who made dreams come true or really had time uh, to study and develop themselves. Uh, the result is always the same. People are more fulfilled and committed with the company. Uh, so this is something that is uh, priceless. Um, talking about the, the, this, uh, the, the, uh, COVID-19 impact uh, when the unexpected uh, arise uh, due to this uh, all this work we have been doing we felt that we were prepared so this pandemic did not catch us of guard because we already had this cultural uh, change in the company and we were able to send uh, 2,500 people home overnight so we had the tools ready for everything to work um, smoothly and uh, here we, we already talked a lot about it, uh, this acceleration that this, this uh, COVID-19 brought us well, made uh, some important steps, like the most skeptical maybe leaders or people had to take the leap and the fears have been uh, overcome um, as productivity has not been affected and we managed to guarantee the most important. So we were able to keep people safe while ensuring the continuity of, 
of the business. Uh, it is incre incredible how in only a few months we were able to move forward, I would say, some years. Um, of course, what, it, what, is, what happened and is still happening is challenging us. And uh, now this forces us to go further and rethink all this program and our flexibility initiatives because in the light of this new reality, uh, some things really came for some adjustments and now is uh, we are fully working on that. Um, and also, uh, I don't know how I am about the time, but to share, share really with you that today, uh, more than ever, we realize that the future of work is now. So it's the present, or maybe it was yesterday. Uh, so what we would say is that more than flexibility policies or programs, uh, the important thing is, uh, we believe, is to implement a culture of flexibility in the company. So well, we think that only this way we will have an organization always ready uh, to respond to these challenges that arise. Uh, being flexible and able to, to adapt um, is what will allow us to thrive in a world that changes from day to day, sometimes from hour to hour. And we really think that if we master this skill uh, of flexibility and keep people at the center, uh, there will surely be uh, no barriers uh, to our successes. Um, and this is what we had to share with you. Thank you, Mafalda. Um, I see the one question we, you already answered. There's a second one. Um, if you can maybe respond in the chat to that while we hand over to Filippo to, yeah. uh, for the last uh, part of the, the webinar. Uh, Filippo, over to you. Thank you to our colleagues from Sonai, uh, Santander and Accenture for, for these perspectives around solutions and initiatives tangibly uh, tackling these issues around the future of work. We are now moving to the section of the agenda, the last section of the agenda, which looks at these uh, principles launched by the Council for people-centered technology transformation. And for that, we'll have our colleagues from Fujitsu and CP Group providing uh, their uh, thoughts. First of all, uh, Mel, Mel is with an overview on those principles and the Fujitsu angle, and then Viranon Futrakul on CP Group. Uh, so I'm handing it over basically to Mel directly. Uh, Mel, uh, the microphone's over to you uh, to take it further on these principles. Thank you very much. And I uh, hope you can hear me okay. Yes, absolutely, go ahead. Great. Um, uh, Davide, if you could go back to the um, summary slide uh, before the Fujitsu slide, that would be great. Oh, there was a... Oh, actually, yeah, if we, if we start on the Fujitsu slide, that's fine. That's fine. Okay, fantastic. Thank you very much. So, um, so with regard to the um, principles, first of all, we can't um, start without mentioning the oppressive shadow of the pandemic and how it's changing our lives and our working lives um, and combine that with the current industrial revolution um, where technology and innovation are accelerating at this astonishing rate where even with the best of intentions um, deployment might have um, might be deployed or developed with unintended consequences on or inbuilt discrimination. Um, and with all of that together, we have a heady mix of uncertainty and anxiety. But of course, there is hope for something better and when the new normal fully established itself and how we negotiate this path and how we build the new future is our challenge um, in private sector, um, in society and of course within governments. Um, like the Sustainable Development Goals and WBCSD's Vision 2050, no one entity or organisation can achieve these ambitions alone. Collaboration is key and these business principles for people-centred technology transformation for the future of work, um, we've jointly developed a great resource for organisations of any size to adopt or to use as an inspiration. Um, so, uh, Felipe covered briefly on uh, Vision 2050 earlier and I just wanted to uh, jump into the kind of um, impactful and memorable theme which is in two tiers, that is um, 9 billion plus people living well but also within planetary boundaries by 2050. Um, and these principles um, um, have a, a, a key quote in them which I, which I will quote verbatim and it says, a future with inclusive workforces that are secure, motivated, skilled and prepared for any challenge that comes next, where people's lives are enriched by advancing technology and where society can prosper from equal access to new opportunities. So, I mean, that's a, a powerful statement there about what the principles are driving towards. Um, now, the principles are boundaries, so um, they're 
there are uh, around employees and our supply chain um, and there's some recommendations of where we might look at the societal impact of the future of work um, however it's hard to talk about um, the first two aspects without um, the society aspect. So if you indulge me, I will touch on the societal aspects um, during this chat as well. Um, so why did we look at building these principles? So um, we talked about the rapidly advancing technology, such as automation and artificial intelligence. Um, for hundreds of years, technological innovation has yielded anxiety and sometimes anger. Um, if we look at the word sabotage it has origins in the french word for sabot a cheap shoe hollowed out from a single block of wood often worn by manual workers and those manual workers um, were against the technological innovation which threatened their jobs um, and they would walk around noisily um, in their wooden shoes hence they were called saboteurs Similarly, across the Channel in England, the Luddites built a reputation destroying textile machinery and feared that their skilled jobs were at risk of automation. And today the word Luddite is used as an insult. Um, people wanting to destroy progress or considered so dulled by ignorance that they are unwilling to yield to the inevitability of technological advancement. But at the time, these radical move movements were people with real concerns who were not communicated to or consulted, people who had families to feed, people who wanted to feel valued and didn't see the alternative employment open to them. Um, they felt obsolete even. And of course today we do have worker protections and human rights legislation but it's not universal especially in our supply chains and employees are rarely consulted on systemic change or technological change the risk in the modern days we have a gigantic population uh, predicted to rapidly increase to almost 10 billion by 2050 and can we glibly state that we were able to retain retrain create new jobs and have enough work for all of those people in the world to live well and within planetary boundaries and the anxieties are the same whether it's 1800 or 2050 automation and technology are sometimes considered a potential threat especially in low paid but key jobs and this is why from a very early stage in our working group we didn't want these principles to end up as a self-congratulatory checklist aimed at big corporations but for everyone whether directly employed or in our supply chains um, and we've seen the COVID crisis disrupting um, uh, industries such as aviation, for example, and conversely other industries, they've had to adapt, push agile technology plans forward, facilitating home and more flexible working, um, and in some cases leading for better diversity and inclusion of workers. So in terms of an audience, um, these principles, they can be aimed at anyone in an organization, but four key roles are suggested. Um, and again, this is from, from the uh, principles themselves. Firstly, senior executives, they set the strategy and agenda for programs. Secondly, the technology and innovation leaders guiding the strategy and implementing it. Thirdly, human resource leaders absolutely need to be included from hiring practices, job redesign, reskilling, upskilling, or redeployment of employees. Uh, and also in our procurement teams, um, those leaders are responsible for sourcing the services in the supply chain where many hundreds and potentially thousands of workers, some who may not have a direct voice, will be contributing. And finally, of course, we have to consider the employees and the employee representative groups themselves, both directly employed and in the supply chain. Transparency and trust is key. Uh, these are the people most affected by the change and their voice and opinion should be a prerequisite of any program of change. So um, if we move to the next slide, oh, sorry, actually we are on the Fujitsu slide, that's fine, we'll stay there. So whatever, whatever services or products an organization provides to their customers, unless they define themselves um, by being a people company first and foremost, they will fail. Um, so in Fujitsu, we are proud to offer digital and innovation services to our um, customers, but it's people that underpin in everything um, and last month we announced our purpose and which is in the top left on the slide to make the world more sustainable by building trust in society through innovation so people at the heart of our philosophy whether it's our employees or our customers or any other stakeholder in, including society so i'm laboring the point but the future of work it's about people first and foremost and technology and innovation should be an enabler for people not an inhibitor within Fujitsu we talk about innovation being human centric and um, on on the right you can see there with the ecosystem spread around it 
Um, but when we talk about being human centric, it draws from three areas, inclusivity, sustainability and trust. All three criteria need to be met to deliver successful technology transformation and enable those various ecosystems. Um, so if we move to the next slide, please, Davide. Um, so lastly, I'm conscious I haven't mentioned what the principles are. So to wrap up and in the interest of time, um, a summary, it captures a lot um, of what I've spoken about. The download is available, of course, um, and um, yeah, we, can, we can answer questions either in the chat window or after the session. Um, but the three areas are um, respect, engage and empower. Um, respect being respect workers' human rights when developing and into implementing new technology that, that impacts work. Secondly, um, engage. Engage workers in technology transformation. They should always be part of the conversation. And thirdly, empower workers to benefit from new technology now and in the future. Uh, and that's, you know, being future focused, looking at protecting jobs, creating new value, new jobs, better jobs for um, our colleagues. Um, and society as a whole. So thank you very much. Um, I think uh, hopefully I've caught up some, some time and we can hand over to Viranon. Thank you, Mel. Over to you, Viranon. Hi, hi, thank you. Sorry, David, if, if you can um, help me with the uh, presentation. Uh, you could go up to the first slide. Uh, sorry, it's the uh, next one. Oh, thank you. Well, just, just to give um, a brief overview. Uh, sorry, can I have the slide before? Sorry. Thank you. Yeah, just, just to give you a context of where we're coming from. Um, uh, CP Group, we are a conglomerate um, and we actually currently employ about 360,000 people worldwide um, based in eight business lines um, in 20 plus countries. Uh, our main core businesses, as you see here, is really in agri-food, retail, and telecommunications. Um, so we work, work alongside a wide variety of people, from farmers, factory workers, you know, 7-Eleven store clerks, call center staff, all the way to office managers. And this isn't including uh, suppliers within our, our supply chain itself. Now, the reason... Um, for my talk here today, it's really that we are currently in the process of establishing a responsible technology policy. And part of that, uh, David, if I may have the next slide. Part of that is, is to understand, first of all, what foundations we want to put in into the responsibility technology policy, because how we develop, how we adopt our technology, as well as our digital transformation itself, is actually essential for our day-to-day -day and future operations, um, really for our employees, our customers, and, and our stakeholders as a whole. Now, in this slide, really, um, just to share with you, uh, what we're doing is the foundation starts off with actually our principles, our own CP Group principles which really, you know, it's benefiting the country where we operate, the society, which really is people, and lastly, our company itself. Now, we also have to look forward, um, and that is where our vision comes in, which is we want to become a leading tech and innovative conglomerate. Now, to do that and really be part and responsible um, for our employees and society, we also, uh, we have incorporated um, B WBCSD's uh, future work principles, as Mel um, kindly helped explain earlier, which is we have included that we will need to respect workers, engage workers, and empower workers. And that will be part of how, part of our technology policy itself. Now, if you see in the above, it's really the elements the core policies that will be incorporated and it will incorporate other dimensions in regards to people and planet. So as you see here, when we talk about human rights and labor, we'll be looking at how we're going to assess future skills um, based on data. We'll look at how we're going to commit a culture of training 
reskilling, upskilling. We'll also focus really on investing and innovating in job creating fields. This will be part of the philosophy we are, we are developing, uh, policy we're developing right now. Furthermore, we also look at health and well being, which is really promoting digital balanced lifestyles um, for our customers, um, for the public, as well as we're going to look at leveraging technology that will help prevent prevent or look after our mental and physical health of our employees as well as consumers. In terms of privacy, we'll be looking to raise awareness for the public of their rights as well as protect consumers uh, and employees in regards to their personal data. And when we're talking about um, responsible technology, it also involves the environment itself. So we'll be looking at how we're going to include proper management of e-waste because we're in telecommunications business as well. Um, we'll be looking at promoter greener skills and jobs, and of course, apply environmentally friendly technology. Uh, the slide that you see here is really the foundation of what we're trying to achieve. Um, if I may, Davide, uh, the next slide. Now, uh, this slide itself is to show you the process that we will go through. So starting off, uh, I'll be looking at what technologies that we develop or we adopt, how are they disruptive towards the human and environmental aspects itself. Secondly, we'll also be look at <clears throat> how it affects uh, the economics, the social, uh, environmental, in terms of internal and external within our business. And thirdly, in the process itself, we'll also be engaging other partners, WBCSD, of course. And also, um, as you see here, we have a Digital Council of Thailand who looks after digital transformation, uh, digital training for, <clears throat> for people within, within Thailand which we will apply to other countries as well. And of course, fourthly, we'll be laying out, as I uh, talked about before, in regards to our core policy issues. And at the end of that, um, we will come out with our policy statement, but not only that, we'll come out with action initiatives that will be based on those policies itself. So what, what I'm really trying to share here today is that the future work principles has helped us and will help us in terms of how we will drive and develop our own responsible technology. And it also applies towards how we operate our business as well in this regard. And as an example, if I may, uh, Davide, the next slide. Uh, we're currently, uh, you could go to the next slide, sorry. During this COVID period, I just wanted to share that as, as part of, of our responsibility, what we have done here at CP Group during COVID-19 is that we have created an online platform free of charge um, for businesses, for educational institutions to use while they have to work at home, while they have to study at home and developing technology that is of assistance to others is, is something that I, I think other companies can help share as well in this regard. So if you have any questions, uh, very much welcome it. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, uh, Viranon, and thank you so much, Mel, also for teeing it up with your perspectives from a Fujitsu perspective and then uh, with the CP group uh, sharing the insights <clears throat> around responsible technology uh, policies in terms of the assessment and development. Oh, very insightful. Thank you so much uh, also for that. I'm very much conscious of time, uh, four minutes over time at the bottom of the hour. So let us slowly wrap up. I don't see any questions directly, but please don't hesitate to continue uh, feeding that uh, chat. Uh, but let us wrap up slowly uh, the uh, session. Uh, with a number of uh, information pieces for you. So basically, future work that wbcsd.org uh, gives you uh, all of the insights into 
uh, many of the topics uh, discussed today, including uh, deeper dives, if we think of the Santander uh, case study, uh, but basically looking at the context around the disruptions to the future of uh, work, the leadership angles around uh, solutions of members, and of course also uh, the principles uh, launched today and introduced uh, by our colleague uh, Mel. So uh, please uh, watch uh, that uh, particular uh, space for what uh, is uh, being outlined and what is being shared and fed uh, on a weekly uh, basis, including news stories and latest developments on tools and activities by members. Um, wrapping up today's session is also a wider reference to a number of uh, things coming your way. First and foremost, uh, the slides and the recording of this session will be made available to you, of course, at the end of our second call uh, later uh, today. Uh, but also an invitation for you in the context of COVID and in the context also of our discussion today uh, to visit the COVID-19 platform we have set up with uh, the business response at the core of our uh, information on that particular uh, platform. We have uh, well over 120 initiatives and actions uh, featured there, but also an invitation of you in the business community uh, to share uh, your uh, information from your companies aside. What are you doing? What are some of the practices that are emerging around in particular employee health and the recovery of uh, your business? Uh, we have many examples uh, shared, but we'll continue to feed it and the site will only be as good as it is being fed on a regular basis and being uh, kept uh, up to date. So a kind invitation to all of you uh, to continue uh, in that uh, particular uh, regard. And then uh, last but not least, at the very last uh, slide, we always end up with saying, first of all, uh, thank you. Thank you to all our speakers uh, from across uh, six uh, of our uh, members. A warm thanks to you for your leadership in shaping uh, the future of work and for your uh, kindness in sharing your perspectives uh, today. A thank you also, of course, to all of you in the audience uh, who were with us for the last uh, 90 minutes. A thank you to the team, uh, David and Natalie in WBCSD, but also our events team, our communications team, and all of our colleagues to, who make these uh, events uh, happen and inviting you of course to keep following these events uh, through the link uh, here and certainly the, the key message out of all this is of course uh, wishing you all well in terms of health and well-being and of course uh, safety so with that said we're going to uh, close this session and uh, looking forward to future engagement opportunities with all of you thank you very much and reach out anytime thank you